All right, guys, so I'm Brandon. I'm doing my presentation, or uh, my research on the Torrey Pine on Santa Rosa Island. So the overview, the reason we're doing this is it's through the Park Service, and what we're trying to do is determine the temporal scale in which the population on Santa Rosa is changing. And my hypothesis was the Torrey Pine population is increasing due to the efforts to restore the natural habitat because they took the ungulates off of the island. Uh, that was done in 2013. Unfortunately, I was a little off. It seems to be slightly declining, but we'll get into that. So it was roughly disturbed for about a century, and uh, recent attempts that finished in 2013 removed all non-native animals. So my methods were, for the demography plots, were the first part. We took pre-existing demography plots, and um, we gathered the information on them. And that included the tree width, tree height, its DBH, uh, the overall tree health, if cones are present on the tree, and new seedlings and saplings are accounted for. Uh, after that was done, what I wanted to do was I took aerial imagery that dated back 76 years, and that was provided by the National Park Service. And I geo-referenced those and over overlaid them so that we could see throughout different years how the population was expanding. And so the results for the demography plots, so this is the population on Santa Rosa. So as you can see, the first census was done in 2014, and it had 329 Torrey Pines. And then what we just finished in January 2016 showed that there were 278 Torrey Pines remaining, so we're down 51 trees. But you can see that most of that change is in these class one trees, which are under 30 centimeters. So of the mature uh, Torrey Pines, it is relatively stable, although the population is slightly declining. And uh, that's it. Hi, um, I'm Zach Buckley, and I'm doing a comparison of a mainland and Santa Rosa Island population of Bishop Pines, or Pinus Americata, using a uh, common garden experiment. Uh, my hypothesis is that the Santa Rosa Island population will have high, uh, greater germination success and higher growth rates than the, island po or the mainland population under post-fire conditions, and the highest growth rates will occur under conditions of high precipitation with ash cover. Um, these last two are just a couple problems we ran into. One was the precipitation controls in the greenhouse. Um, they're a little difficult to figure out, and as you, some of you know, Paul just left. So no one to um, explain it to us. And then we've had time restraints because we've only got about two months to grow 800 seeds. So it's kind of hard to measure them all in that amount of time. Um, methods, we started with a census and we counted all the trees on Santa Rosa Island. We took DBH, diameter of breast height, noted if they were reproductive, uh, noted their health and their height, and we downloaded that into a map and created a spatial analysis map. Uh, in the common garden, we planted 800 seeds, 400 from the mainland, 400 from uh, the island, and we put them under four different conditions, high precipitation with ash, high precipitation without ash, and low precipitation with and without ash. This is just a layout of what the greenhouse looks like. And then my results, we found 2,207 trees on the island. Um, the other results aren't exactly real yet. But the island population had the highest growth rate under conditions of high precipitation with ash cover and 68% of mainland seeds germinated, 78% of uh, island seeds germinated. And this is a graph demonstrating the frequency of height classes of the trees. So one is the lowest height class and five is the highest. And that's it. Hey everybody, I'm Sean. Um, so my study is looking at the native revegetation of the eucalyptus, or following eucalyptus removal and burning on Santa Cruz Island. Um, so just in a quick overview, so the National Park Service um, is doing a wetlands restoration project um, in Prisoners Harbor. And so their current phase is removing 40 acres of eucalyptus trees. Um, to date, they've removed 20 acres. And um, so this project is going to help park personnel and management kind of focus their efforts on how to um, uh, feasible restoration objectives um, for these areas. So my hypothesis um, would be there, are greater, there would be greater species diversity in unburned plots 
um, that have been seeded compared to the burned plots um, that haven't been seeded. And so methods. So this is a diagram of my study plots. So there's seven meter diameter um, spheres. And so half is seeded and half is not seeded. Um, for each, and so for each burned plot, there's a paired unburned plot. Um, this table up here shows our native seed mix. So these are all species that are growing around these uh, areas. And so we measured and weighed out um, each seed um, so we know exactly how much were distributed, distributed in the plots. Um, and yeah, so the results will be based on percent cover and then the number of uh, seedlings. And then this is just a results uh, graph. Um, so this is just for one particular study plot. And so the bars are showing seeded versus non-seeded. And then we also have that for each species um, going across the bottom. But yeah, that's it. All right, guys, my name is Patrick Costa, and I'm doing my research on uh, coastal erosion at Port Wayne Beach. So Port Wayne Beach is here, and what we have is we have two harbors that are blocking the normal movement of sand to Port Wayne Beach here. So this is a picture after they've nourished, and you can see that there. And um, yeah, so anyways, my hypothesis is does the sand at Port Wainimi Beach erode at different rates throughout the year from seasonal changes and events such as winter storms? So those are some pictures of nourishment. So my methods, I have a few different areas that I'm trying to look at um, for my project here. Uh, shoreline tracks, photo comparisons, profiles, <coughs> sediment analysis, and biodiversity on the beach. So each of these things will tell me different things about how the sand at Port Wainimi Beach is changing and what's going on at the beach. So uh, first, my shoreline tracks. I've made a map here. Um, what I will be doing, which I haven't done yet, is I'll be plugging it into a digital shoreline analysis system, DSAS, and it will calculate the rate of change that the beach is eroding away. So um, that's what I'll be doing there. Uh, next, I have photo comparisons, so I have before and after pictures, and I'll be comparing uh, <clears throat> last year's data from Alex Green's to my photos this year, and I'll also be looking at the uh, seasonal variation of photos between the two seasons. So here we have some examples. Um, this here, you can see the big drum, like the big drums up there. So this is um, how it looks now, and this is how it originally looked with Alex's. Um, those are some of Alex's photos up there. And then here, these are some of my photos, um, just kind of showing the same area. Um, this is this is up in the north part of the beach, but those are comparing the same area. So you can see that the berm is changing and it's becoming more scarped out. <clears throat> uh, next, these are my profiles. Um, here, this one is our more, most north transect. And you can clearly see that the beach scarp is eroding away, and the beach is going away with the time. Um, so as the time goes on, we're just seeing more and more erosion. It was originally uh, taught to, uh, people have told me that the beach is south facing, and it's likely that the beach is going to erode more in the summer, um, less in the winter. But we can see that it's eroding a little bit quicker. Here we can see a little bit of um, beach nourishment is happening more south on the beach. I'm also looking at sediment analysis. Um, haven't completed that yet. And the biodiversity. That's it. OK, so I'm Taylor. And my project is a water quality comparison of natural kept streams and channelized streams in relation to the impacts of urbanization on Conejo Creek. And my hypothesis is that Natural kept streams will have better water quality than the channelized streams. And those are just some pictures of each of my sites. Um, so Conejo Creek, you probably all know that it's in Newberry Park, just right up the grade. Um, first, what I did was I broke it into four sections, the <coughs> North Fork, uh, South Branch, Arroyo Conejo, and Cayugas Creek. And so I have two sites at each of those in each of those creek sections. Uh, the North Fork runs through a master plan community called Dos Vientos. And with that, uh, they worked with Costca in order to 
integrate open space into that community. And with that, they left Conejo Creek partially natural. Um, so in comparison to that, the south branch of Conejo Creek um, is outside of Dos Vientos, and that is channelized. Um, both those run into Arroyo Conejo, and that's tributary to Cayugas Creek, and then that flows out to the ocean. Uh, for my methods, so direct testing using the multi-parameter SON, and I've tested for chlorophyll, temperature, conductivity, salinity, total dissolved solids, oxygen, pH, and turbidity. Um, using that, and then at some of the sites where there wasn't enough water, I had to use bottle sampling, which you can see in that picture right there. Um, and then all that downloads to software and into Excel. So this is one of my graphs, and this is just comparing chlorophyll over time between the sites. And so you can see a big difference between the North Fork and the South Branch. Um, and you see like a big, on this, uh, January 8th was when we had that big rainfall. And so you can see that chlorophyll levels were all pretty low, but then they go back up once it got hotter and less water flow. The water's more shallow in the South Branch, so um, it can create more algae. That's it. All right, ready, steady, go. All right, so my name is Dylan, and my capstone is the geomorphology of Water Canyon on Santa Rosa Island. So the purpose of my capstone project is to mainly set baseline data for to allow for uh, future evolution of stream channel to be um, recorded and to study the physical changes in the stream channel due to erosion and faulting processes. Um, so for my methods, I had 21 sample site locations. Um, I used a survey tool, uh, Nikon 5.C total station to take cross sections of the stream channel. And basically what that does is it measures slope distance and elevation, which you can put into a graph using the slope distance on the x-axis and the elevation as the y-axis, which basically looks like that. And uh, so what I found was upstream of the fault line, you have a, a much more heavier meandering stream type and a more loose, unconsolidated sediment, uh, mainly due to loss of vegetation from ranching. And, and then downstream of the fault line, you get much more consolidated sediment and bedrock exposure with slightly meandered but much more deeper uh, V-cut stream channels. So, and then another thing that I try to do is basically clearly mark each sample site. Um, they're all rebarred with uh, caps that say National Park Service uh, CSU Channel Island Survey site um, to basically allow for future um, research to be done. And basically upstream is probably gonna be the best spot to study erosion because, uh, like, like I said, downstream is just basically a lot more bedrock and things like that. Hi, everyone. My name is Evie Forster. I am studying demography, plot, demography plots and germination differences between Torrey Pines from Santa Rosa Island, which is in the Channel Islands National Park, and Torrey Pine, and the Torrey Pines from Torrey Pine State Natural Reserve, which is all the way in San Diego. Uh, I am studying demography plots on Santa Rosa Island. And my hypothesis was that there, since there's less disturbance from the unglets, because there's not as many there, this should result in the island Torrey Pine population increasing, but I found that not so much. Uh, the common, I'm doing a common garden experiment with the mainland and island Torrey Pines. And my hypothesis is that the island and mainland will have different growth rates due to populations being exposed to different uh, environments and disturbances. My methods for the demography plots is I recorded DVH, the height of the trees, the health, the cones, new, and if there's any new seedlings, and the percent shade. While in the common gardens, I used Western Regional Climate Center to determine how much water I would need to do for precipitation. I also, um, I also am putting down how much leaf litter I need to put for the common garden. So I'm testing 
precipitation and leaf litter. So there will be one without leaf litter and then one with leaf litter and then one with high leaf litter, and, I mean high water and low water. And then I am collecting the data and recording the how much they grow every few days and uh, we're watering them by hand. Uh, we are also recording the germination day and the death day and the temperature of the greenhouse. So on the island, we found that the population is actually declining, mainly the class one, which is the new saplings. Uh, and that, and then for the island and mainland Tory pine growth rates, we found for the germination, we found that they are slightly different. So from my graphs here, I found that the mainland and it did better with high leaf litter and low precipitation. Same with zero leaf litter and high precipitation, while the island did better with than did did better in both those, but it did better than the mainland in with zero leaf layer and low precipitation. But they have the same with high leaf layer and high precipitation. And that's it.